session today is an update on the tax issues that have happened in the last three months or so, uh, the last quarter. So we'll um, we'll get started. You'll notice on your on your login that uh, there's an area that you can ask questions or or chat. So we'll if you have any questions along the way, please feel free to to type those in and we'll get to as many as we can. For those that we can't get to then we'll we'll deal with those um, afterwards. I can give you a call or shoot you an email if, if there are any um, more detailed answers that we need to, to go through. Okay, so to, to start off today, I thought I'd start with um, one of the, I don't know if it's a favourite topic as such, but uh, the topic of trusts is a ever-present one at, at the moment. and. The issue that I want to start off with is in relation to the review of tax issues affecting trusts. That at the end of July this year, the the government released a, a discussion paper that looks at um, seeking views on a more what they call a more workable approach in relation to fixed trusts. Particularly, there's a, a very restrictive definition at the moment in relation to fixed trusts. And for those of you that that deal with losses in trusts. You'll know that uh, you know there's that that term of fixed and indefeasible interests that uh, we need to to get get through in order to to determine whether we've got a fixed trust or not for for the trust loss rules. Now the the colonial first state case that was um, that came down last year set the cat amongst the pigeons in relation to what is a fixed trust and what is not, and uh, so as a result of that. Uh, this this discussion paper has been released, so there'll be some some movement on on that in the uh, in the coming months and, and probably a couple of years, I imagine. So basically, the, what the the treasury is going to be looking at is trying to um, the treasury is trying to look at is whether there are other options available to define a fixed trust uh, under the ordinary provisions of the law, rather than looking at this um, relying on the commissioner's discretion, which a lot of us tend to do these days, in order to get some some conclusion as to what a fixed trust is. The other area in relation to trusts that's um, moving along at the moment is uh, the review of the taxation of trusts. You remember earlier in the year I spoke about a, um, a review being undertaken by Treasury as to how trusts should be taxed because of the, the change in the way that trusts have been utilised in the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, the tax laws in relation to trusts haven't necessarily caught up with that, and it's causing, as I'm sure you're all aware, quite um, quite a few difficulties in in how we deal with trusts and distributions to to beneficiaries, etc. Now that review of trust is um, in the in progress at the moment. There was a proposed start date for those uh, the new rules uh, to start the first of July next year. It was a base on the basis of a lot of uh, consultation that, that's gone over the part on over the last few months. The government's decided to defer that start date until the first of July, 2014, and they're looking at releasing a policy design paper, which will further develop some of the options that were originally put forward on how to to treat the taxation of trusts. That policy design paper is is due to be released in September. And uh, so, hopefully, sometime in the next couple of weeks, we'll we'll see something about around that. That'll the purpose of that paper is really looking at things like the, how character retention and streaming will operate going forward, and hopefully provide details that will allow taxpayers to and their advisors um, to determine how those reforms might impact on you know, particular circumstances that we have in, in relation to our clients. Uh, it's also hoped that, that that policy document will will tackle some of the, the practical issues that we're having to deal with on a day to day basis, such as you know when when beneficiary, beneficiaries entitlements need to be determined. So so it's a little bit of a wait and see, but hopefully in the next couple of weeks we'll we'll see a little bit more movement on that front. Uh, and then the view is that at, still at this stage they're going to look at re releasing uh, legislation to um, enact these policy changes by the middle of next year, which will hopefully give us some, enough time to actually go through the, the issues and apply them to our clients and in plenty of time for, for the start date of 1 July 
Now, I'm sure, again, all of you are aware in relation to those of you that do deal with trusts, for a number of years now we've had to deal with the ATO's interpretation on trust resettlements you know, as to when a, a new trust would be created in the, in the ATO's eyes. A number of years ago, the tax office released what they called a statement of principles that talked about when a new trust would be created. And as a <coughs> excuse me, as a result of that, you know, the underlying principle in that in that document was really that a, a new trust will arise um, where there's a there was a fundamental change in the trust relationship, and there was an essential um, and that the change that arose was basically in the essential nature and character of the uh, of the trust relationship. That was what would cause a, a new trust. So that. Um, that statement of principles was, was withdrawn on the 20th of April this year and when the statement of principles was, was withdrawn the ATO advised that they would be reissuing uh, a document that would set out its views in relation to when a, a new trust would be created. So what we got in relation to that, well I guess how that came about was in relation to um, the a case called Clark's case which was handed down in, in 2011 and that basically looked at the circumstances which could give rise to a change in the nature of the trust. It was specifically um, related to whether capital losses were available to be carried forward in this particular trust circumstance. And the conclusion that was reached following Clark's case was really that there would be a continuity of the trust estate. Um, you know, that that would be maintained as long as the trust wasn't terminated for trust law purposes. So in essence you could make a change to the, the trust itself as long as um, the trust wasn't terminated. So the Commissioner's previous view was really that we looked at, well, the Commissioner looked at a focus of whether or not um, the trust had come to an end and also on whether there had been changes in either the property, the membership or the, the operation of the trust which might be sufficient to result in some loss of continuity of the trust um, even though it hadn't been terminated. So in light of the, the Federal Court's uh, decision in Clark, the Commissioner appears now to accept that, that the continuity of a trust is really a function of whether the trust continues its existence under trust law rather than whether there are any underlying changes in the, um, the property or membership or operation of the trust. Now the Commissioner when he, um, he he didn't issue another statement of principles which I'm, I think we're all quite pleased about because that statement of principles sort of set out the ATO's view but it, it wasn't a formal document like a ruling that we could you know specifically rely on. It was sort of there in limbo. So the new document that the Commissioner has issued to set out his views is Taxation Determination 2012 D4, noting that it is in draft at this stage, but it basically sets out the Commissioner's preliminary views as to whether CGT event E1 or E2, which relate to creating a new trust, um, and basically says that those events will not happen in the, if the terms of the trust are changed pursuant to a valid exercise of the, of the power contained in the trustee. I guess the, the key there is that it needs to be a valid exercise of a power. So where amendments are being made to deeds, that great care needs to be taken to ensure that there is a power to amend in the first place uh, and whether that amendment extends as far as that amendment power extends as far as the change that the, the trustee is wanting to make at that particular time. For example, I've, I've seen deeds recently where there's been a general amendment power. However, it's it's been somewhat limited to uh, to exclude things like appointing new beneficiaries or removing beneficiaries. Um, or there was another one recently that said that we could amend the deed for a whole host of, of reasons, but the definition of income could not be amended. So all of those things need to be to be looked at and considered before uh, rushing in to, to prepare an amendment for a for a trustee. So in this um, the determination, the commissioner also says that you know 
CGT events E1 and, and E2 may still occur where there's an amendment, particularly where that amendment causes the a particular asset to be subject to a separate charter of rights or obligations. So essentially that um, you know, by, by such a change it results in the termination of the trust. So there are still circumstances where the amendment can give rise to a, a, uh, a creation of a new trust and a resettlement uh, for CGT purposes and quite possibly for stamp duty purposes if you're ever looking at amending deeds. Um, but on the whole the, the restrictions that we had placed on amendments in the past as a result of the ATO's interpretation under the Statement of Principles no longer are there. So it gives us a little bit more room to move. Now a recent case in relation to to the um, to trust issues. This was revolved around present entitlement. As I'm sure we're all aware that in recent times we've had battles with uh, preparing trust resolutions and making sure that we've made valid distributions prior to 30 June, etc., so that um, beneficiaries would be presently entitled. This case was a uh, a case where there was a, a unit trust. One of the unit holders, or the unit holder, was a uh, a family trust, and that family trust, being a discretionary trust, had distributed to individual members of the family. The commissioner reviewed the the return of the unit trust and made some amendments to the uh, well, we wish to make some amendments to the to the unit trust income that was reflected. And that had a flow-on effect through the family trust and through to the, the ultimate individual beneficiaries from the family trust. The evidence that was presented in the case indicated that one of the individuals wasn't involved in any of the decisions that were made in respect of the, the family trust. Uh, there were no meetings of directors that were held and this particular individual only, only uh, signed documents when requested. So, and, and the other in, individual um, effectively made all of the decisions required by the family trust. He was the one that decided how the distributions were going to be made um, and that resulted from discussions that he had with his tax agent after the end of the financial year when the accounts were prepared. And although it was the, the tax agent's general practice at the time to uh, prepare trust distribution minutes for, for trust estates, this particular um, practice wasn't followed in this case and that was because the tax agent had worked with the, the particular um, individual uh, previously so they had some familiarity and so it took a, I guess a few shortcuts in, in preparing everything. The decision that was made by the court was basically as there were no valid trustee distribution, trustee resolutions that were made um, then the, the beneficiaries that purported to be entitled to the, the income of the trust were not, um, were not presently entitled to receive the income of the family trust at the end of the years. One of the other arguments that they tried to run was that the accounts and the tax returns recorded distributions to the beneficiaries and that those were sufficient evidence of the, the declarations of, of distributions that had been made you know, prior to the end of the year and the court didn't accept that. One, because there was no evidence to say that, uh, that that decision had been made prior to 30 June, particularly as the accounts and tax returns were, were prepared post 30 June. So I guess it's another, like, if we haven't had it reinforced enough in the last few months, that uh, there's another reason to, I guess, um, be a bit more diligent when we're looking at preparing resolutions, making distributions to, to beneficiaries, making sure that they're, they're done in accordance with the, the trust deed at the time. Another trust case that uh, has come through in recent times was a case called Greenhatch, which some of you may have heard about. It's in relation to the streaming of capital gains. Now I'm not going to go through the, all of the details of, of this particular case but the the conclusion was basically that the capital gain that was flowed through uh, from the trust would be included in the in the taxpayers assessable income 
and that was required to be determined by, on a proportionate basis. So the case essentially, um, I guess, essentially affirmed that the government's need to introduce legislation that, that allowed streaming of capital gains and frank dividends, because this case is basically saying that, well, it doesn't, um, it doesn't matter whether you've got a streaming clause specifically in your in your deed. Um, that you know there are you can stream, but that doesn't mean that. Uh, you can just generally stream. You have to make a specific de decision to do that, and anything else is, is done on a proportionate basis. So with the new legislation that came out last year, it basically says you need to make a, a specific decision to stream capital gains or frank dividends to the beneficiaries. But everything that you don't make a specific decision in relation to um, is just thrown into one pool and distributed on a proportionate basis. Now, this issue here is probably not a, a new issue from the uh, the last quarter, but I've had a lot of questions in the last few months from uh, VinLink members about TFN withholding and trustee beneficiary reporting rules. Now, I just I've put in in these slides here just some links to uh, the ATO website, which has some quite some um, useful outlines of the the rules in relation to how we deal with those rules and, and the information that needs to be included on taxpayers' uh, tax returns to, uh, to correctly reflect the, the outcomes that, uh, that have been achieved. So these rules basically set out you know, what is a closely held trust um, and closely held trust is defined somewhat differently for a TFN withholding purposes and trustee beneficiary reporting purposes. Uh, and also, you know, these play, these web pages go through. I guess there's a, there's a bit of a flow chart there to, to say, well, if you if you do this, then this is where you need to end up on your on your tax return. What information you need to include. So, just a helpful reference that I thought people might um, might benefit from. Now to move away from trusts, uh, the other big talking issue of the the last little while is uh, living away from home allowances. You might remember that back in June we talked about the introduction of uh, new rules in relation to living away from home allowances and there was a, a lot of kerfuffle going on about how it was going to uh, hinder the employment of uh, overseas workers and making living away from home or working away from home more attractive for, um, for individuals in their employment capacity. As a result of those, um, the, the submissions that were made, the government decided to defer the starting date for that legislation. It was supposed to start on the 1st of July. It's now starting on the 1st of October, which is really only a couple of weeks away. And essentially those, those rules are not really changed a lot in, in essence from, from what they, they were previously. There have been some amendments that have gone through in the last couple of months, but essentially the conditions for a living away from home allowance from the 1st of October is basically that the individual must live away from home to perform their employment duties. It must be a requirement of the employer, it can't just be at the, at the request of the employee. Uh, the usual place of residence uh, has to be available for the immediate immediate use and enjoyment at all times when the, the taxpayer and the spouse are living away from the property. And it's important to note there that in the in the explanatory memorandum to the to the law, they talk about the usual place of residence being a, a place where they or their spouse have an ownership interest. And ownership interest goes back to the definition in the main residence rules as to what an ownership interest is there. There's also an example in the EM that talks about you can live in the property, sorry, you can own the property or you can rent the property. So there's some clarification being sought now as to, well, normally an ownership interest in the context of a lease is a, is a long-term lease, you know, 50 or 99 years, um, whereas the, the use of the term rent in the example indicates that a, a shorter period of time and, and not such a, an ownership interest is, is required. So 
just seeking some clarification at the moment, but um, just just be aware of, of that ownership interest requirement that's sitting there in the law. There's also a reasonable expectation that the uh, that the individual will return to their usual place of residence once the, the job's been completed. And different to the the rules prior to all of these changes, is there's going to be a 12 month time limit on the the use of these living away from home allowances. Now that 12 months can be reset in particular circumstances. There might be times when there might be a pause in that 12 months um, versus a, a resetting of it. And so if you've got somebody that's on a longer term um, job that that is living away from home, there'll be need to, to have a look at seeing what that 12 month uh, threshold is and, and how that gets reset. Now there are amendments that were, were introduced just recently um, by the government which basically ensured that these allowances are going to be taxed within the FBT system. Originally there was a combination of the FBT and, and income tax systems that was going to cause some um, substantiation and you know, documentary nightmares. Uh, there's also an expansion of the definition of fly-in, fly-out workers and drive-in, drive-out workers uh, so that they could, could access the, um, continue to access the, the concessions even if it was longer than 12 months. Uh, like I said, in relation to that 12 month time limit, there's some clarification in the amendments about how what will constitute a pause versus a resetting of that time. And yeah, there are certain transitional arrangements that exist for permanent residents and, and temporary residents that uh, you'll need to, to be aware of. Now in relation to uh, companies, there was a taxpayer alert issued in uh, mid-July, I think it was, in relation to uh, the accessing of private company profits via dividend access share arrangements. Now this is basically targeted at situations where you might have a company that has has profits and a new class of share is issued to the to an entity that's associated with the existing shareholders and that new class of shares might only hold dividend rights and uh, may also be redeemable in, in a four year period. Now the purpose of of those was to enable the profit to be distributed out to that other entity, but the economic benefits you know, essentially um, belonging to uh, to the original shareholders, maybe by way of loan or distributions to other taxpayers that have losses, etc. So essentially, it all happened within the same family family group on the whole, but um, there were some tax benefits associated with that. Now, I remember many years ago um, looking at dividend access shares and the, the government or the tax office always had issues with with a value shifting applied you know, depending on how much the dividend access share was issued for, whether it was worth anything at all uh, or was worth a whole lot of, um, of money because of the, you knew that there was going to be a dividend paid. There was always that uncertainty and the, the commissioner was um, very quiet about it. So he's now in this, in this uh, alert pretty much set out all of his concerns and there, there are quite a few. They range from there being a potential Division 7A issue, um, whether that's through interposed entities, you know, amounts being lent through interposed entities etc and payments being made. Whether the dividend access share is a debt or an equity arrangement. Value shifting of course, you know, one of the reasons that the new class of shares was issued within, you know, to be redeemed within four years was because the value shifting rules do have a, a provision in there where if a particular transaction unwinds within a four year period then the, any value shift that might have arisen would be deemed not to, not to have occurred, would be disregarded essentially. So value shifting is an area. Of course the old, uh, the old favourites of part 4a uh, whether there's dividend stripping or franking credit benefits uh, is there. Promoter penalty regime was also mentioned in the alert as well as mention of the um, the tax practitioners board. Now, I think the reason that those two areas were issues were, were raised is because in some circumstances 
It's the, the advisor that raises the, the potential for the dividend access share to be issued. Um, it's not something that comes from the, the client themselves. And uh, in some cases, I've, I've heard where the, the taxpayer themselves is not really sure of what the rights are that are attaching to that particular share and just go along with the tax planning that's been done. So, so I think that that alert is really putting everybody on notice. Uh, taxpayers as well as advisors that uh, this is an area that uh, the Commission has now decided that he has some, some serious concerns about and will be um, keeping an eye out. Okay, so in re also in relation to companies, the, the carryback losses rules, now you will have heard uh, in the, the budget earlier in the year there was an announcement where companies would be able to carry back losses for a period of time uh, to and get a, a refund essentially of tax that had been paid in a, in a prior period. The draft legislation and the explanatory material for that has now been released and the the idea behind the, the carry loss rules is that you know from 1 July 2012, so the current year that we're in, companies will be able to carry back up to a million dollars worth of losses and get a refund of the tax paid in the previous year. But from 2013 onwards, then it'll be, a, the company will be able to carry back a million dollars worth of losses against tax paid up to two years earlier. There are certain integrity rules that have been introduced um, as part of these, that will be introduced as part of this legislation. And they essentially mirror the, the integrity rules for carrying forward losses so the continuity of ownership and uh, the same business tests, those will both still still need to be considered when you're looking at carrying carrying back as well as carrying forward losses. <coughs> There's also a, an issue to, to consider in all of this is that uh, you will only be able to get a refund of, of taxes previously paid to the extent of the franking account balance that exists in the company at the, at the time. So if you've paid tax in one year and then paid a dividend out to shareholders, following year you, ha you have losses, uh, carrying those back, those losses back won't necessarily result in a, in a refund um, if the, the dividend's already been paid out, um, so there's nothing in your franking account balance. Okay, small business CGT concessions. As some of you know that uh, I do a, a fair bit of work in, in this area um, and I guess one thing that, that comes through in talking to, to clients about, about these rules and trying to reduce their, their uh, capital gains tax obligation, um, the, the amount that's included in their income. They want to reduce it as much as possible, so accessing the discount and, the, and the, these concessions is quite important. The rules are quite complex though, and there is a, a tendency, particularly from a client's perspective, to try and shortcut those, those rules and to get a particular result. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, ignoring the, what the rules say doesn't necessarily mean that they, that bit goes away. There are some, some useful uh, ATO guides on these small business concessions. There's quite a detailed guide on their, their website that uh, can provide some, some useful information when you're trying to work through these concessions for a client. Um, it's important to note though that, you know, as with all of these things, there's, there's no real substitute for, for what the law says. Sometimes commentary and uh, fact sheets, etc., can try and simplify things to a point where you know, it's not exactly what the, what the law says and you don't want the, although you can rely to some extent on something that the ATO has published, um, you know, the law still stands as, as the principal point of call. So when looking at these concessions, there's a couple of things that uh, that I notice and, and the ATO have, have released some, some information recently saying that they have noticed in their review activities as well. Um, errors that are made in complying with the eligibility requirements for these these concessions. I guess one generally that, that I've noticed is looking at the, the basic conditions to start with. There's a, a tendency to leap straight through to the concessions without really considering the detail of what those basic conditions are. 
Do I have an event? Do I have a gain in relation to that, that event? Do I meet the $2 million turnover threshold test or the 6 mil net asset test? And do I have an active asset? All of those things are important to consider um, before you go too much further. And in all of those, in the active asset test and, and also the 6 mil and the 2 mil tests, you need to consider who's connected with or affiliated with the taxpayer because you may need to include their turnover or their assets in the calculation of your net assets. And uh, you know, there are circumstances that I've seen in the past where those have been ignored and if we had put them in, if they'd been included, then uh, the, the result would have been completely different to what was, what was put in the, the return. So it's a, there are some very you know, specific criteria that need to be satisfied and definitions as to what connected with is and, and what an affiliate is. It's just a matter of, of working through that process, you know, getting a group structure chart of everything that you can possibly imagine that might be linked to the client and then seeing um, how they all fit together. The other thing that uh, the ATO have noticed is people incorrectly calculating the small business participation percentage when working out whether there's a significant individual and CGT concession stakeholders. Now that, that participation percentage uh, can be worked out using direct interests and indirect interests. It also um, does have some, uh, has, is influenced to some extent by the nature of the, the rights that are attaching to shares that, that are issued in a company. I was talking earlier about dividend access shares. If there's a dividend access share on issue, then there is a real risk that um, you know, people don't have a, a, the rights that they, they require to jump through some of the hoops that it, they need to to get through these concessions. So it's a matter of looking at not just the number of shares that are on issue um, to work out whether you've got a 40% interest or whatever. It's a matter of looking at what the rights are that are attaching to those interests as well. Now Division 7A, Last year at the tax forum that was held in Canberra, it was it was noted that Division 7A was a, a particularly thorny issue for uh, for small business. I imagine that was putting it somewhat lightly, um, particularly in relation to users of trusts and needing to to um, use working capital, you know, and reinvest in their business. And, and that came on the back of the ATO's interpretation of how to deal with UPEs. Um, and loans that had been, you know, they'd made their view clear um, a short time earlier. So that's caused some some concern. As a result of as a result of that, the government has asked the, the board of taxation to actually look at options to simplify Division Seven A, um, but also ensuring that the uh, the integrity and fairness of the tax system is maintained. Now, call me cynical, but Simplifying integrity and fairness of the tax system all in the same sentence means to me that it's probably going to be a little bit more complicated to, to work through. So it's uh, it's a little bit of a wait and see, I guess. But uh, you know, will the proof's in the pudding? So we'll wait and see what what actually comes out and uh, and and judge it on it on its merits. Um, the review is going to be looking at the current operation of Division Seven A. Um, including whether, whether it's really giving um, effect to the, the policy intent when it was introduced, what are the problems with the current operation of Division 7A, um, the extent of those problems and, and whether you know, what are the options for resolving the issues that, that currently exist. And also look at examining whether there are, is potential for broader reforms to Division 7A overall. That's an area of constant change, tax. You've got to love it. Now, transfer pricing, the uh, transfer pricing side of things, for those of you that um, have clients that have got international dealings, uh, you will have come across transfer pricing issues in the, in the past. For those of you that haven't, you know, transfer pricing basically refers to the situation where, where prices are charged from one part of a group um, to another part of a group when they're buying and selling within, within the group and the, and the amount that they're charging each other for that. The prices that are charged will impact on the income and the deductions that are claimed and therefore the taxes that are paid in each country. So if, 
if my entity in Australia sells to, to Canada, then depending on the pricing of, of my product, then I can influence whether I pay more or less tax here in Australia or more or less tax in Canada. There are certain rules that have existed for a number of years now that require entities to, to price intergroup transactions to properly reflect what the, the economic contribution is of the Australian operations. And there's a ruling that was issued back in the, in the 90s, 98-11, which sets out arm's length methodologies for, for working out uh, prices that should be charged. The government has recently passed a, uh, a bill that that brings Australia's transfer pricing rules into line with what they call international best practice and improves some of the integrity and um, efficiencies of the system. For those of you that do have clients that are uh, that have international dealings, it's important to note that these changes take effect from the 1st of July 2004, so it is a retrospective uh, legislative change. So if you do have clients in the, that have been subject to transfer pricing rules, it's, it's worth having a look at them to see whether there is, is any impact on your, your client's circumstances. Okay, charities and not-for-profits. There was uh, legislation introduced to Parliament recently which uh, towards the end of August and um, some more just recently been cleared. The purpose of this legislation is to establish a, a new independent statutory office that will um, basically be the Commonwealth level regulator for the not-for-profit sector. It's basically uh, also going to, well, the legislation is also putting forward a, a new regulatory framework for the, the not-for-profit sector as well. Now the commission that's being set up as the, the Commonwealth level regulator is going to uh, commence operations on the 1st of October 2012, so again in a couple of weeks. The purpose of this commission is really just to, to act, I guess, as a, as a one-stop shop for uh, registrations, tax concessions, accessing Australian government services, etc., and concessions, so that uh, charities and, and not-for-profits don't have to go all over the place to get uh, to get approvals through and uh, and uh, get their their endorsement for DGR status or charitable status, etc. So it's hoped that this will will uh, make this the process for not for profits uh, a bit easier as the, as time goes by. As part of these this legislation that was introduced, there was also some like, tightening of some of the the provisions that talked about restating the in Australia special condition, basically saying that the charities need to generally operate principally in Australia and for the broad benefit of the Australian community. Looks at standardising um, certain other special conditions that are in the legislation for the not-for-profit sector. Standardising what's really meant by the, the term not-for-profit. And uh, yeah, so, so those changes or well, the bill will effectively uh, commence from the date of royal assent, which is uh, not, not here yet. So I just want to go through a couple of cases now, a few cases on, on various matters. The first one is in relation to the um, property when, when property is acquired, what the purpose of the acquisition of that property might be. As, as we know, um, you know, if you acquire something for in investment purposes, then it'll be on, on capital account. Um, however, if you're, you've acquired it for, as part of trading stock or with a profit making intention, then the the tax outcomes can be quite different and you know, in the CGT you can get access to the, the discount and, and the like so it's um, you know, it can be quite a, a different result from a taxpayer's perspective depending on, on what basis the property is being held. Now in this case it was a case of August and the, and the Commissioner. The taxpayer argued that the property was actually held for investment purposes so the court had to consider whether it was on bit, or held for investment purposes or there was a profit making intention. And when the court looked at the, the evidence, the, the factors that they took into account was that 
the evidence that was presented didn't reveal that there had been any change in circumstances that would explain the taxpayer's decision to sell the property. So when he sold the property, he treated it as a capital gain. When the taxpayer um, was looking to acquire the property, he sought advice from a and another taxpayer that uh, was in the practice of redeveloping rundown properties, rejuvenating them, and, and then selling them for a substantial profit. So, and he was he was seeing, seeking to essentially copy what this advisor w was doing. Um, you know, he was a, a developer of, of sorts. There was also the particular issue with a, a document that had been provided to the tax office that supported the, the fact that there was a long-term investment strategy. But in the court's view, that document hadn't been created immediately after the original agreement. Uh, it wasn't provided to the tax office in the course of their audit investigations. And the proceeds of sale for the property weren't um, were distributed in accordance with the original agreement and not in accord, not reinvested in accordance with the uh, the addended, amended document that uh, that was presented late to the to the tax office. So all in all, the uh, the taxpayer lost. It was seen that he acquired the property for the purpose of profit making by sale, and there was no investment purpose to his to his acquisition. Next case is in relation to whether a director is an employee for the purposes of uh, superannuation purposes. Um, this is a director, an employee of a, of a company, particularly. There's a situation where the family trust, in this case, Kelly, was not entitled to a superannuation deduction because the the taxpayers, the individuals that the superannuation had been paid for, were not employees under the uh, Superannuation Guarantee Act. The court noted in that case that directors of a company aren't entitled to claim remuneration for services performed at, at common law under the, the Corporations Act unless it's specifically provided for in the company's constitution or it's approved by the shareholders. Now in this case there was no resolution in place by the, the trustee company of the, of the trust uh, to establish that there was an entitlement to, to payment for the performance of their duties as directors and the court therefore ruled that the directors were not uh, employees of the corporate trustee and as such the, the deduction uh, was, de was denied. So I guess it's something to, to think about when you're looking at making superannuation contributions for directors um, in their capacity as directors rather than as in employees of a, in another role that you need to make sure that you're not only making a payment um, for them, but that they're actually entitled to that payment so that all the, the documentation's been, been covered off on. You've checked the constitution to see whether they are able to be to be paid under the constitution and uh, and whether and also getting the shareholders to approve that that payment. A personal services in, uh, income case talked about two particular looked at two particular areas: uh, unrelated clients and the business premises premises tests. Um, in relation to the unrelated clients test, um, the the tax office sorry the, the court said that the taxpayer failed this test because, in its view. The clearest case of an offer to the public was one where the, the terms of the offer indicate that it's it's addressed to the members of the public in general, and an offer that's made to a particular individual, which if, if it was rejected, was repeated to other specific individuals, um, won't be an, an offer to the public. So it was a you know there was no no public offer element to the um, to the work that the that the taxpayer had been doing. In relation to the business premises test, the, the court said that there needed to be both a quantitative and a qualitative assessment of the use of the premises that, uh, that the taxpayer used and you needed to consider in that what activities were mainly conducted on the premises and where other activities were conducted. And in this particular case, 
the court found that most of the activities, the significant activities, were actually carried on at the client's premises rather than at this business premises. And as such, the business premises test was not, not satisfied. A couple of tax residency questions. Um, with the, the world getting smaller and smaller every day, there's more and more questions come up about taxpayers deciding to move to another country for a, a short or long period of time and then the question inevitably comes as to well, where are they resident, can they pay tax in another country and not, not pay tax here. This particular case looked at, um, and it was an AAT case, that held that the, the taxpayer was an Australian resident because he didn't have a permanent place of abode outside of Australia. Now this guy was a, a technician in the oil and gas industry and he left Australia in 2008 I think it was to take up some employment in Oman in the Middle East and when he was there he, he lived in a, a single room apartment that was provided by the company. The AAT held that uh, and I think that with that, that apartment he also shared that with another employee on a, on a complimentary roster. Now the, the AAT said that the taxpayer couldn't be described as having a permanent place um, in Oman because it was shared accommodation provided by the company and he, the taxpayer, had no legal interest in the property. He had all his mail sent to Australia, he, had all his, he only had his basic possessions in Oman and as soon as his uh, activities were, were finished in Oman he would, he would leave and come back to Australia so he had no apparent ties to to Oman beyond his employment either, so it was uh, decided by the AAT that he, he really was an Australian resident and because he didn't have a permanent place of abode outside, couldn't prove that he had one outside. The other case was in relation to uh, a marine engineer that left Australia again in 08 and he went to work for a company in Dubai. He, initially he was allocated a, an apartment, a company apartment in, in Dubai, but then he spent most of his time travelling around the world uh, in connection with his employment. The AAT again held that he hadn't really established a permanent place of abode outside um, or in the United Arab Emirates or anywhere else, uh, even though he did have a connection with Dubai, it wasn't satisfied that that, that connection was sufficiently strong enough to warrant a finding that it was his permanent place of abode, let alone his domicile of choice in that particular year. So uh, the AAT decided again that he was a, a resident of Australia, uh, and continued to be a, a tax resident of Australia. So what I guess these two cases demonstrate is that it's important to look at all of the, the circumstances surrounding a client when they decide to, to leave Australia for employment purposes or whatever. It's not just a matter of looking at how many days that they were out of the country, it's looking at what their intentions are, what they've actually given up here in Australia. Um, for example, do they still hold their Medicare card, are they still on the electoral roll, where do they get their mail sent, have they just left their home locked up so that they can return to it at any time, where are their family, uh, where are their ties? You know, all of those things need to be considered uh, when making a decision as to whether somebody says yes or no to whether they're an Australian resident on their, their return each year. And it can be quite a detailed um, process that you need to go through asking a whole, a whole lot of questions of the, of the taxpayer and, and sometimes quite, um, quite personal questions that you need to, to get into to, to establish a particular position that, uh, that they're trying to um, you know, we're trying to determine where they're actually a resident. So it's, it's something that uh, needs to take a, you, know, you need to have a, a good look at if you've got clients that are in that particular circumstance. This was a question, a uh, quick mention of a case where a, a taxpayer was denied deductions for improvements that they made to a primary production pr property. The AAT decided that they weren't actually carrying on a business of primary production during the relevant years and we're talking about I think five or six years at the time um, you know, on a 500 acre property. Because he wasn't carrying on a, a primary production business then he wasn't, wasn't entitled to the deductions that, uh, for the improvements that had been made. 
they acknowledged that um, both the commissioner and the AAT acknowledged that the taxpayer had genuine intentions, but he hadn't actually reached a point where it could be characterised as a primary production business, and it was really just more the prepar preparatory stages of um, of the business that he was going through. None of the activities had actually advanced much beyond the the planning stage, and there was a the, there was really only a, a tenuous link, I guess, between the activities that the taxpayer had undertaken and the production of income at some future point in time. Now, although you, know, you might think it's a, it's a bit of a, a simple issue, um, I guess you, you, we come across these things all the time as to the timing of when deductions need to be made and we need to consider whether the taxpayer is actually carrying on a hobby, in which case well, we've got one set of results. If they're carrying on enterprise, which can give us some GST implications, um, or whether it's a, it's a full-blown business. Um, you know, so there's sort of you know, a number of stages that, it, that uh, activities can go through before they, they actually become a business and needing to consider what that actually is and, and on what basis you're claiming a deduction for the, the expenses that have been incurred. The tax office have recently um, put a page on their website as am I carrying on a business which gives some of the, their their indicators as to what they, they feel needs to be in place for carrying on a business and there's also a ruling uh, 9711 I think it is that talks about um, am I carrying on a business of primary production but it has some general um, factors to consider for, for business you know, generally. As far as GST is concerned um, there have been a few Things that have been that have happened. Uh, carrying on an enterprise, there was a case that with the AAT found that the taxpayer hadn't um, satisfied a, a burden of proving that she was carrying on an enterprise. Um, so they denied input tax credits that she had claimed as part of that supposed enterprise. She wasn't able to provide any records or really give any um, any independent um, evidence that. There was an enterprise being carried on, and what it was what it was doing. So it's something to, uh, I guess, keep in keep in mind when applying for an ABN and ticking that box that you want to register for GST. You know, what what is the enterprise, and and how do I support the fact that the enterprise is being carried on? Also, it, there's a draft taxation ruling 2012 D3 that uh, talks about tax invoices. And what are the, the minimum information requirements? You'll remember that when GST came out, there was a, a ruling it introduced that talked about what the requirements were. Given that we're quite a few years down the track from when from the introduction of GST, it's probably worth having a, a revisit of what those requirements are. Um, you know, there are certain information requirements that need to be on that that tax invoice for it to be valid. And if you're um, in the unfortunate position where you've got to send the tax invoice to the tax office in order to claim an input tax credit, you need to make sure that it does um, meet all those those requirements. There was a taxpayer alert in relation to non-commercial arrangements that uh, where large amounts of input tax credits have been claimed in, in relation to the acquisition of intangible items at inflated prices. Just, I guess, be aware of that's 2012-5 taxpayer alert. And there's also some uh, draft legislation that's been released in relation to the GST and the margin scheme, particularly as it applies to the supply of subdivided land. Um, just really talks about the different calculation methods that can be used to to determine the the margin for the purposes of the, the margin scheme. I know there are a couple of you that have uh, retirement villages as, as clients that uh, there are a couple of GST rulings that were introduced in one July and one in August about the GST treatment, treatment of care services and accommodation and another one on the treatment of exit payments for retirement village residents that uh, are an essential read if you've got clients that, are, that operate in that space. GST and HP arrangements um, from the 1st of July 2012, all components of HP transactions are going to be treated as taxable supplies regardless of whether there's a credit component that's separately disclosed on the, in the arrangement. 
and the associated fees and charges are also subject to GST. So that simplifies dealing with uh, which with HP arrangements um, now. Now there's, there was some, a law introduced earlier in the year about uh, enabled the Commissioner to exercise his discretion to retain refunds. Uh, there was a draft practice statement released a short time ago that looks at the factors that need to be considered by the Commissioner when determining whether to retain a, a refund. And they'll look at things like the likely accuracy of the information that's been notified to the, to the tax office, whether there's any um, evidence of fraud or evasion or intentional disregard for the law or recklessness, um, the impact of retaining the amount on the, on the taxpayer's financial position, uh, protection of the revenue, there's looking at the, the complexity of, of the, the issues that are involved in verifying the, the amount that's been notified, whether the information that's been notified is consistent with other information that the ATO has, um, either provided by the taxpayer or somebody else. So all of those things come into um, the consideration of the, the Commissioner when they're, they're not giving us refunds back as, as quickly as we might like. In July, the ATO released its 2012-13 compliance program and it basically sets out, that compliance program sets out the areas that they're going to focus on for the following 12 months. Um, no real surprises, I guess. Um, you know, it covers a whole host of different areas, including SMEs, large business, small business individuals, um, avoidance, tax practitioners, superannuation. Particularly the focus areas that for this year are uh, looking at unusually high levels of work-related claims of IT managers, plumbers and defence force personnel, uh, tax avoidance schemes that are, that are engaged in by high income earners, unreported cash transactions, I think that's a permanent one on there, but in this case particularly for the, um, the plastering and cafe industries, looking at particular um, identifying sham entities and looking at the GST regist registration applications. So could explain why getting an ABN is becoming more and more difficult. Looking at contractor arrangements, that's a bit of a multi-pronged attack, I think. It's coming from the tax office as well as other government areas and unions, etc., as to how contractor arrangements work. Uh, the treatment of, of private company uh, profits, you know, loan arrangements, etc., so Division 7A, dividend access shares, etc., are in in the, the firing line, employer obligations in relation to superannuation, uh, the self-managed super fund sector just generally, uh, project we can be in other related you know, tax avoidance areas and the last point that they put in there was ensuring that tax and, and BAS agents also um, meet their own tax obligations. Now subsequent to that, uh, the well it, I guess as part of that compliance program they, they said that they would be updating that information on a, on a quarterly basis. So last week the ATO released information on its current compliance focus areas and it was particularly tax avoidance schemes, business structuring arrangements being marketed to the medical, dental and other health professionals, um, hybrid trust structures and tax driven employment arrangements to avoid income tax, FBT or superannuation guarantee payments. So as you can see, the, um, the tentacles are spreading far and wide, uh, making sure that we, um, we're all doing as the law requires. I'll just skip through this data matching. There's a data matching for family tax benefits and parental leave pay, so just to be aware of. Some updates on the ATO website, uh, some useful information that I guess just to be aware of that, that is there. Um, 2012 tax return and schedules instructions are always an exciting read. Um, I've noted there particularly some information in relation to trust tax returns. There's a, a new item on there, item 64, that seems to be causing some concern in the how do we answer it, what's, what's in there. So it's worth having a look at those instructions and that marries back to the draft tax, tax ruling uh, TR 2012 D1, I think it was, on the income of a trust estate that we'll need to to be borne in mind when filling in that, that item. And uh, 
just the last couple of things. The Tax Practitioners Board has now introduced CPE requirements, which um, hopefully this is assisting you all with. Uh, effective from the 1st of July 2012, if you're registered with the Tax Practitioners Board, either as a tax agent or a VAS agent, then you have CPE requirements that need to be satisfied. As you can see there on the slide, 90 hours over three years for tax agents, 45 hours over three years for VAS agents. And those activities need to be relevant to the advices and the services that you're providing. Um, need to be provided by um, organisations with suitable qualifications or people with suitable qualifications and practical experience in the area. And meeting a, a you know, obviously help you meet the minimum level of um, hours as specified by your registration. The OSR, Queensland OSR, has notified just recently that it's no longer going to be able to, you're no longer going to be able to lodge documents or make payments in person at the counter of their, their offices in, in various locations. And the documents can only be lodged by post and all payments have to be made either by post or electronically. The last thing I just want to mention is that on uh, LinkedIn we have a, a VinLink network discussion forum. So if you've got any questions on the, the things that have been raised today or, uh, or any other issues that come up, then um, feel free to, to join that discussion forum and then we can, uh, we can see what sort of things are, are coming up in the, around the traps and maybe include them in future updates or maybe have specific sessions on, on those areas. But um, yeah, I do, do look at that discussion forum regularly. So if there's, there are things that you want to, to raise, then feel free to, to post something on there. All right, well, thank you very much for your time and uh, hopefully we'll catch up in the, in the next quarter. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.